In our previous episode, a slight change in the timeline spiralled into the largest invasion Europe had ever seen. The Mongols completely overran Eastern and Central Europe, but at the same time, the combined force of Bohemia and Austria inflicted the biggest defeat they ever endured. For Europe, this was a sign that they could turn the tide if they could unite, and for the Mongols, this turned a campaign for conquest into one of vengeance and destruction. When you're fleeing from the Mongols, as I'm sure you soon will be, you want to travel light and fast, but you also want your cash, cards and keys on hand. Rather than capturing Chinese engineers and trying to get them to solve this for you, try getting a massive discount on a sleek solution this holiday season with Ridge at ridge.com slash wizardsandwarriors, who have kindly sponsored this video. First there's the Ridge Wallet. This shrinks the amount of material needed to carry cards and cash, giving you a sleek and stylish wallet that is not only smaller than even the smallest wallet we had, but comes with a lifetime guarantee. It's made from military-grade materials, sure to save your life from a Mongol arrow or two when our timelines start converging. There's space for 12 cards, and there's a banded clip system if you want to attach cash as well. But you'll need your keys too, so use the Ridge Key Case, another sleek little gadget that's small, looks good, and holds six keys in an organized fashion, no more messy clumps of keyrings. The lifetime guarantee covers this too, and Ridge offers a 99-day money-back guarantee on their products if you somehow don't prefer them to your old setup. Both make great gifts with the holidays coming along, and you can get them for up to 40% off in their holiday sale until December 22nd if you go to ridge.com slash wizardsandwarriors, link in the description. King Wenceslaus of Bohemia managed to achieve the impossible. But as his domain became flooded with Polish, Hungarian and Austrian refugees, he knew that the war against the Mongols was just beginning. The Ruthenians had managed to secure not only numerous pieces of Mongol equipment, but also valuable information, detailing the extent of the nomadic threat. Cups were raised, bodies were buried, wounds were bandaged, and the once rival Frederick the Quarrelsome was now given a special funeral in Prague as a martyr. But Wenceslaus knew that there was little time for celebration or mourning, as he read the papal call to crusade. As Louis IX read a copy of that same parchment, he knew that this called for unprecedented action, even if that meant a radical change in his policies. The Capetian king was known to be generous, patient, just, compromising, courageous, and a patron of the arts, but above all, he was the most devout Christian king who ever lived. After defeating a coalition of rebellious vassals, supported by Henry III, Louis fell seriously ill with a form of malaria at the end of 1244. Upon his recovery, which he saw as a sign, he pledged to take the cross and lead the Seventh Crusade into the Holy Land. But now he knew that his army would have to face a different enemy, one that threatened the very heart of Christendom itself. Edicts were issued to every corner of France, which was now the strongest state in Europe, arriving at the castles of noble families who had by this point made crusading a favorite hobby, each house boasting the number of its ancestors who took the cross. Additionally, the wide spy network was directed outwards to the neighboring empire in order to entangle its web of alliances and dynastic ties. Indeed, the Holy Roman Empire was far more fractured than ever, with hundreds of factions, loosely held by claims, marriages, and shared hatred for either the papacy or emperor. Louis quickly discovered that not only was Frederick's empire divided in two, but between the hundreds of princes, only a few were prosperous or had any form of stability. Among them were Holland, Thuringia, Brunswick, Ulic, Nassau, Savoy, Bavaria, Meissen, and above all Brandenburg, which rose from a backwater county to a dominant regional power under the leadership of John and Otto, two brothers who ruled jointly. Between them was the rising Rhenish League, featuring over 50 prosperous towns under the joint leadership of their clergies and merchants. Finally, there were unstable regions, such as all of Italy, the battlefield on which the imperial loyalists faced the papal supporters. Additionally, the war had depleted the areas of Lorraine, Holstein and Mecklenburg, as well as numerous small-scale skirmishes. In Friesland, a small sect of Cathars was crushed by the Stendiger Crusade in 1234, and the region was still devastated. 
On paper, the empire was strong, but even in its darkest hours, it was never more divided. Louis wanted to enact the order of the Pope and beat back the Mongols, but even if he managed to gain the support of most of the princes, looking at the map, he understood that the logistics of this campaign would be untenable. Holy Roman Emperor Frederick's supporters surrounded Bohemia, controlled the Alpine passes, and thanks to the recent victory at the Battle of Giglio, the Imperial Navy of Pisa crushed Genoa, thus assuring naval dominance in the region. Frederick II's refusal to join the crusade and command to every lord not to engage the Mongol host but hold up in their castles meant that no army could reach Bohemia without risking their supply lines. The solution was extreme but necessary. During the winter of 1246, Pope Innocent IV toured the cities of France preaching the Seventh Crusade, with the kings of France, Aragon and Navarre riding behind him. This procession culminated on Christmas Eve at the unfinished Cathedral of Notre Dame, where Louis IX was appointed as the leader of the Seventh Crusade, aimed against the Mongols. Additionally, the one-year-old marriage between his brother Charles and Beatrice of Provence was annulled, so that King James of Aragon would take her hand. In return, Charles was promised the crown of the Kingdom of Sicily, once the now five times excommunicated Frederick II was vanquished. Finally, in the place of the pretender, the saviour Wenceslaus was selected to be the next emperor. The majority of the French nobility swore upon holy relics, including the crown of thorns, and prepared to head east, while Louis shook the hand of his old rival James, who was the only one who could crush Pisa's fleet. Back in the east, an emergency curl tie was assembled by the leader of the campaign, Batu, where all major leaders were called to discuss their response. The size of the host and years of careful planning that went into assembling it matched their resolve, but their failure to predict the Ruthenian betrayal raised many questions. How should they punish the traitors? Should their policy towards the tributaries change? Who would get the task of avenging Batu's brother? And lastly, how would they regain access to the steppe? Each leader put their proposal forward, with many urging Batu to trust no one but his own people. Subutai came up with a plan that not only punished the disobedient Ruthenians, but tested Nevsky and Mindalgas, whose cavalry, and especially infantry, were crucial for the success of the campaign. The tributaries would be turned against the Mongolians' enemies, with the promise to keep what they conquered, as long as the land itself was left barren. In the meantime, the main host trampled its way towards Prague. The Mongols took King Bela's son, Stefan, and started indoctrinating him. The seven-year-old boy was a royal hostage in Batu's court, accompanying him wherever he went. A move meant to keep the captured Hungarian king in check, who knew that if his son was lost, his line might die out. As for the king of Poland, Bolislav, his brother was forced into the Keshig, the royal guard, who made sure he was safe and knew the Mongols' ways. Subutai ensured that his tributaries understood the price of betrayal by sending them on a brutal campaign, where they had to personally collect the ears of the fallen Poles and Ruthenians. The northern front covered a large area, which was quickly assaulted by Boleslav, Alexander and Mindalgas. Subutai merely acted as an overseer, forcing the vassals to inflict unspeakable horrors on the rebellious towns and villages. Another two men, led by Burka, crossed the Carpathian Mountains once more, using its superior mobility to shock the defenders of Halic in the winter cold. When the dust settled, there was no trace of either Leo or the capital of the region. The destruction was so systematic that the site remained uninhabited for the next few hundred years. Daniel, the Ruthenian king without a kingdom, and his remaining 4,000 were cut off from their homes and could do nothing to prevent their destruction. Back in Bohemia, Wenceslaus was facing a difficult dilemma. The majority of the electors had chosen him as emperor, a countermeasure against both Frederick II and the Mongols, but the only way that could be achieved was if he was crowned in Mainz by the Archbishop of Cologne. There was no telling when the Mongols would strike, and even a short absence could mean the fall of the kingdom. But the grim reality was nearly half of his army was lost at the Battle of Olomouz. Moravia was devastated by not one but two invasions in the span of five years, and the only way he could save his country was if he returned at the head of a massive host. 
In order to prevent a mass panic, Wenceslaus left both of his sons at the capital as a sign that he would return, leaving Bohemia in the hands of his heir Vladislaus. The weapons ransacked from the Mongol corpses were distributed between the refugees, and the majority of the Ruthenians under Daniel garrisoned the formidable Prague castle, bringing the number of defenders to 10,000. In March 1247, Wenceslaus headed west with a few hundred knights and refugees from Ruthenia, Poland, Austria and Hungary. He also brought Mongol bows, lances, armor, some captives, and even the corpses of a few fallen soldiers and their mounts, in order to show the people of the empire that the enemy was real, but not invincible. Upon entering the lands ruled by Frederick's supporters, he was stopped, leading to a tense confrontation. However, the king was also escorted by his wife Kunigunda, who was the cousin of the emperor, and managed to fool the guards, who were told that she was being escorted to her ancestral home in Swabia. Once he crossed into Thuringia, Wenceslaus was met by Margrave Henry Rasper, who congratulated him on his victory and joined his host. With each day, more and more crusaders arrived, begging to get a glimpse of the Mongol bodies and study their weaponry. Even with orders to feet and losses to attrition, Batu's force numbered 100,000. However, at this stage, he knew he had to pick his battles, at least until Ruthenia was leveled. A third of that number was designated to carry out the task, while another 50,000 were reserved for the Bohemian campaign, giving the rest time to consolidate Poland and Hungary. The goal was to conquer the powerful and well-defended Kingdom of Bohemia before the winter, as the Mongols preferred to fight the large-scale campaigns between spring and winter, giving enough time to overcome its defenses and rendezvous with the forces of Subutai and Birka. The Bohemian Massif was a well-defined border, with multiple choke points which were easy to defend. However, Batu devised a plan meant to overwhelm his opponent, by sending smaller parties through every possible entry point, in order to check the readiness of the Bohemian army. These raids began in April 1247. They gathered information and secured several passes into the countryside. The four leaders then poured in, wreaking havoc as they went. The nomads avoided any stone fortifications, instead focusing on small towns and villages, from which they gathered thousands of slaves. Whenever groups of refugees were spotted, they were driven towards Prague, which now swelled from 22,000 inhabitants to over 60,000. Ostrava, Bruno, Radetz and many others were wiped off the map as the Christians prayed for the return of the king. According to the unknown chronicler, indiscriminate slaughter marked their track, and fiendish tortures of their prisoners gratified their revenge until no eye remained open to weep for the dead. Prague was separated by the massive Letava River in two parts, with the urban centre sitting on the right, while the castle was located on the left. The only link between them was the Judith Bridge, since Vladislaus ordered all other wooden footpaths across the river to be destroyed. Additionally, scouts patrolled the left bank daily, so that no pontoon bridges could be built by the Mongols. Batu quickly learned that the king had left the country, and that there was no way he could bypass the river without risking his return or delaying the campaign further. The Bohemians dug a large moat in front of their stone wall, prepared provisions, hired mercenaries, and stocked their towers with arrows and projectiles. The Mongols dug their own ditches and built a palisade surrounding the city as they assembled their siege weapons. On the 12th of May, the Mongols sent an envoy urging the citizens to surrender the city and their Ruthenian guests if they wanted to keep their heads. The messenger was strangled and put on top of one of the captured Mongol horses, a letter pinned to his chest. You heathens may be proficient in the slaughter of women, children and cowards, but here you will find no absolution, only the Lord's wrath. The reaction was immediate. Protective wooden screens were pushed ahead of rams and teams of sappers, each strapped with dozens of captives who were tied to their beams. Traction catapults pulled by more captives, and finally oxbows, sending massive javelins with explosive grenades tied at the end. The crossbowmen had no choice but to fire down on the attackers, killing in some cases family members who had been rounded up from the nearby villages. The Mongol archers rained one barrage after another, but then a thundering boom strengthened the resolve of the defenders. 
the newly invented counterweight trebuchet was an expensive but incredibly useful measure for both offense and defense. This was one of the few instances where European military technology surpassed that of the East, and the Mongols were learning this firsthand, as not one but four of them fired upon them, outranging their own siege weapons and delivering bigger payloads. One of the stones crushed a Mongol catapult, killing several Chinese engineers, while another nearly landed on Prince Shiban himself. Their rate of fire was slow, but as long as they were operational, the Mongols couldn't effectively bombard the city's defenses. Batu then ordered many of the captives to be executed and loaded on makeshift boats, which were to be sent downstream daily. The defenders could do nothing but watch the bodies float under the Judith Bridge by the hundreds. The Mongols then pushed their lines back and only resumed their operations a week later, allowing the stone walls to be repaired. Another two weeks passed, littering the ground with casualties, which were used to fill the moat, but the Bohemians showed no sign of weakness. Suddenly the arrow fire ceased, as the Mongols allowed a single Ruthenian woman to scream out a message at the walls. Batu's ultimatum was directed at the Ruthenian defenders, who were told that they had three days to leave the city and go home, after which he would order the eradication of every Ruthenian settlement except for those who surrendered. The 4,000 Ruthenians within Prague had no idea that the Mongols were already devastating their homes, so panic began to spread. The situation was made even tenser by the fact that except for the boats, which had now become a part of daily life, the enemy made no movements. Daniel and their Bohemian allies advised that no one should surrender and that this was only a trick, so the gates remained shut. On the night of the second day, a huge brawl erupted between the Ruthenian regiments who wanted to surrender and those who wanted to fight, resulting in the loss of 220 lives, which included many citizens. The Bohemian hospitality disappeared, and both sides were not as amicable as before. Finally, Daniel, who felt responsible for his people and country, put down his arms and escorted out all but a few hundred who wished to stay behind. Daniel was immediately taken while the rest were enslaved. A large wooden platform was built outside the range of the Bohemian trebuchets, but in full sight of the defenders, who watched as he was sealed in a giant barrel. The Mongols then handed hundreds of bottles of wine to his followers and forced them to fill it up. Daniel replaced the fermented milk he adopted with wine, and so he drowned in it. The loss of the Ruthenians was catastrophic and added more human shields that the Mongols used to get closer and closer to the city walls. When the defenders ran out of stones, they began tearing down buildings that they could use as projectiles, even stripping the churches of their lead ceilings. The assaults raged day and night, carts full of dry grass were pushed to the gates in order to burn them. Siege ladders were repelled as the defenders poured molten iron from the battlements. The Mongols hurled flaming bundles of sticks, soaking in human fat, which couldn't be put out by water. Despite the attacks, atrocities, hunger and disease, the defenders held out, waiting for their king to arrive. But then disaster struck. On the night of July 21st, five boats drifted onto the right bank, but amongst the dead lay a dozen Mongol warriors who snuck into the city and made it to the southern gate. The guards were killed, and a signal called for the advance of 500 riders, who rushed for the opening. As the gate lifted and the town bells rang, fire and fear spread within Prague. Mongol horsemen galloped through the streets, shooting at anything that moved, while more and more steppe warriors made it inside. The defenders soon realized their position was untenable, so they pulled back to the Judith Bridge, which was already full of people trying to get to the other side. Hundreds became victims of the crowd that trampled them, and eventually four of the twenty archers gave out and the bridge collapsed. In the commotion, a band of Ruthenian prisoners committed their final act against the Mongols by setting a huge part of their camp on fire, destroying many of their siege weapons, before being put down. Batu then gave the order for the systematic sacking of the East Bank, which was raised before the eyes of Vladislaus and captured the trebuchets. The majority of Prague, Bohemia and its defenders were destroyed. The only surviving Ruthenians were the few families Wenceslaus took with him. 
Europe had received a taste of what was to come if it didn't coalesce against the Horde, which was now turning its full attention to the German lands. What they didn't know, however, was that the Seventh Crusade had just gathered for the most important coronation in the history of the Holy Roman Empire, with the only army in the world that could stand a chance against them. The next episode of this alternative history series is on the way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing. This goes a long way to help us in the eyes of the almighty algorithm. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to see what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. Your feedback is very important to us. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.